<laughs> oh wow! <Hi>. <laughs> hey everybody, <laughs> your tech department's here too. Yeah, you're no, okay. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> we're just gonna we're just gonna wing it here. Uh, hey everybody, uh, thanks for tuning in. We were this close, this close to mm -hmm. popping this up on the screen, <laughs> but we pulled through. So uh, anyway, I guess we'll uh, cut right to it. I was going to do a little, well, actually, I got to do, before we get to you, Mel, thanks for being here. Uh, we'll get to you in a sec. I'm going to kick you out just for a second because this, oh, what an S show. It's always an S show here. It's kind of funny though. Um, okay. So uh, it is May 6th. I always have to look that up for some reason. Uh, 2020. And uh, we are here in COVID Town, USA again, live from South Lake Tahoe. And uh, it's, you know, still same deal, not fishing. I've been going fun fishing myself, but uh, not guiding. And uh, we'll have to see what uh, Mel's up to here in a minute. Uh, I know he's, uh, he's in baseball season, so not doing much guiding either. But We'll get to that, and uh, it's going to be good. Good chat. We're going to talk a little major league baseball, talk some walleye, and some steelhead, and all kinds of other stuff, and some feedback, whatever that was. Um, but quickly, before we get anywhere, we're going to do the quick tip of the week. I mean, tip of the week. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, it's uh, as I mentioned, it's very COVIDy right now out there. And some of us are getting back to work, not me personally yet, but I know Washington just opened up again. Um, although I don't know that the guys can guide up there yet, but it doesn't matter guiding or not. You go on recreational fishing. Uh, one of the things that I found, and I used these yesterday when I went out, first time with a buddy, we stayed on the other end of the boat and uh, it was kind of fun to get out and fish with uh, somebody other than myself for a change. But uh, these, I don't know if you've seen these, let's see if I can get it on there. Good day fishing hand sanitizer wipes with anise. These things are unbelievable for uh, you know anybody who's going fishing with buddies, going guiding soon, whatever it is. Uh, you can you know what what I've been telling people is if you're gonna go fishing, you know go fishing with somebody that's at least from your own town, right? Don't I mean your own household is obviously the best bet, but um, you know if you're going with someone that's not in your household. Do the social distancing stuff and, you know, don't touch your face, all that jazz. But you can wipe down all your gear with this stuff, which is really cool because uh, it smells like anise. And as most most fish seem to like anise, springers right now, I know, love anise, which are finally going on up in the Columbia Basin. But um, how many come in this thing? I don't even know. Uh, but these are over, I think they're 70. I can't see without my glasses, but... They're, they're, I remember looking at them. They are uh, above the minimal. I think it's, what is it? 60 or 70% alcohol that you need to kill COVID. So these are cool because you can wipe down all your gear and it smells like anise instead of Clorox or whatever. So anyway, I did talk to them today and they're out. If you go to the website tonight, gooddayfishing.com. But um, he promised that there'll be a few available on the site tomorrow. So if you log in tonight and there's none of the... Uh, GDF hand sanitizer wipes. They will be there tomorrow. So anyway, there you go. That's your tip of the day. So anyway, uh, let's just kick right into it. And uh, my next guest is Mel Stadelmeyer Jr., who is equally at home talking fastballs or, uh, you know, sitting on a tiller talking Lindy rigs and, and uh, back bouncing baits. He is a... Uh, of course, the uh, pitching coach for the Florida Marlins and also owner of Stotts Fishing, which is a uh, big fishing outfit up in Idaho. And uh, let's welcome him in here. Mel, you there? There you are. Man, I'm here. I'm glad to be on. <laughs> that was no, that was a mess. Uh, so, um, so you're in Florida right now, right? I'm in Naples, Florida. Naples, Florida. Uh, and uh, you're near my spring training, kind of waiting to get the word. Yeah, so give us a quick, uh, quick update on that. What's MLB saying? Well, it, you know, hey, hey, honestly, sure. it's a, uh, it's a terrible time in this country, you know, and it really feel unfair even talking about going to work playing baseball yeah. with the state of, of how the country is. And sure. uh, but moving forward, you know, we once a week we've been in in conversations with the commissioner's office mm -hmm. and uh, our ownership and trying to find out 
some some more details to be able to give some our players uh, a more solid foundation of what's going to happen. So as it stands today, uh, sometime early July, and it hasn't publicly been announced, so you're getting it firsthand. You heard it here first, sometime folks. Sometime early July, we're supposed to get back, uh, you know, where we're going to play, who we're going to play. That's yet to be determined. Uh, probably not going to be any fans, right. you know, which will stink. Uh, really for the game of baseball. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to go through one heck of a, a formality to get the players into the ballpark to test every day, to staff, to, you know, still to can continue the social distancing. And it's going to be that way on our, on our boats when we get back to guiding too, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You think about um, as far as baseball goes, I mean, one ball can, I mean, <laughs> every guy on the field could touch the ball and then the pitcher goes to his mouth and all that. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of like, it's going to be hard to teach guys because didn't they make licking your fingers standing on the mound legal again, not too long ago. They, they did. You just have to wipe it. And we've already talked about that. You know, the fact that you get the hand you know, the wipe finger, right. Take your anus wipes out. Uh, <laughs> if I make a mound trip, keep distance, probably wearing masks. You think about it, every time they throw a baseball, the ball gets put in play. You know, our shortstop makes a play, throws the guy out. They're going to have to get a new ball. Yeah. So uh, these are, you know, this is just, it's all new. And, you well, know, it's not going to be the same. They're going to take umpires, you know, the the uh, the review out. And umpires will get back to making, making calls like they did forever. So it's going to be why, the same. Now, now why are they doing that? Well, just to try to speed the game up. Oh, okay. You know, there's not going to be any fans. And yeah. uh, like I said, which is a, is a bad thing. But, you know, I, I, I would tell you that it would, it would be like going back to play in American Legion baseball again. Yeah. But I happen to play in a really good place where in Yakima, Washington, where we made a couple trips to the World Series. So we have to <laughs> fans. But there's not going to be any fans. You know, when we get back to spring training, we're going to run four or five guys out on the field at a time. And that's it. Yeah. Wow. That's what we heard. So, well, you know, I mean, uh, if you guys need scabs, those of us in the old man baseball league are used to playing with no people. So my wife stopped coming about 20 years ago. <laughs> so uh, anyway, well, speaking of, uh, I, I don't mean to embarrass you here, but I dug up a couple nuggets before we get on to the, the Stotts fishing stuff. But uh, who, who's this guy right here? Oh, my goodness. What, what, what are the chicks? You know, my kids are watching right now. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I've already got a couple tips. <laughs> you know, off. That is a young, naive, uh, 20, 21 year old kid. And where, okay. where are the chicks? What, what minor league? What, uh, that was what? the Memphis Chicks, Memphis, mm -hmm. Tennessee, double A level. Uh -huh. You know, when you're young and you got the answers, you're invincible, you're on the way, you're going to make hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. good days. Uh, okay, so this I think is 1990ish. You, you you look a little yeah. little crabby there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I, I was pro probably that was after an off day where I'd been out fishing in Kansas City and got skunked. <laughs> well, that's gonna lead us to Wallach. Yeah, 25 maybe years old, 26. Yeah. Okay. And then fast forward to here. I like this one too. I, it, I, I'd love to hear what you're saying there. It looks like <laughs> you can't believe you, you know, through that. Picture. Well, so, uh, so <laughs> have you ever, uh, talked fishing on a mound visit? I haven't. Okay. I have, I have talked a lot of, about a lot of different things on mound visits. And okay. even other than baseball, yeah, that's trying to get guys to laugh, but that you know what's really weird down here with the Marlins, we're in think about the fish in Mecca. Oh my gosh, very few that's guys, awesome. very few guys fish, oh. and it's which is kind of surprising. When I was with the Mariners, a lot of the guys fished, and mm -hmm. on every, day, day, the fish. every off day, we fished. Really? On the road, you know, we got all these places that we love to fish. Yeah. 
And when we get an off day, a bunch of us players and coaches, you know, we'll fish together. But right. this particular club, and we're really young. We have babies. A lot okay. of them from Latin America. Yeah. Where they throw a a line out around a pop can. Right. Wrapped around of a fishing rod. Right. Yeah. Yep. And so, it's, it's so they yeah. Yeah. So uh, that was going to be one of my questions for you is, is – I know there's not a ton of off days and, and I, it's, I guess it's got to line up the right way too. When you're, you got a full off day on the road, or I guess, I guess a night game, you can still sneak. Now no, you probably get to the park pretty early though. Don't you? So how does that work? I mean, you got to have uh, the, the schedule has to line up. Yeah. JD, I tell you what I do and, and you know me, uh, I love to fish and I would hate to have to make a decision between the two fishing and baseball. <laughs> Well, now you can't do either one of them. <laughs> now I can't do either one of them, and I am not happy. Yeah. But, uh, there's nothing to uh, – in Naples, there's nowhere to go? No, they still haven't opened up a lot of the ramps. And, you know, Miami is uh, – Miami is not a good place right now. They got the keys closed down and barricaded, and, you know, the state's still – we're still blocked in. Uh, yeah. If you leave out of the out of the state, they don't want you coming back in for a while. So – with that being said, you know, I'm, I'm hanging out indoors, but uh, I would love to be fishing. Oh, yeah. That's I mean, that's the only thing keeping me sane is I've told you a little bit about my little uh, just going out solo missions on the lake here in a 10 foot John boat. I mean, it's it's, you know, a third of the size of my normal boat, but whatever. It's just, you know, I've actually fished more during this whole closure thing than I have, you know, just fun fished more than I have in years. And so. You know, silver lining, I guess. Uh, if I'm not going to work, I might as well have a little fun. But, uh, you I've know, seen you. I've seen you. Been, and by the way, you're probably doing more fishing now than you have all the time. You know, the beautiful thing about fishing now on your own is you can experiment. Oh, it's great. And, you know, if fishing, if the fish aren't biting, I'm going home. It's, I'm right. hungry. You know, it's breakfast time or nap time or whatever. It's not like, Oh boy, we got to grind it out another six hours. You yeah, know? Right, right. right. So, um, yeah, and you can throw something out that's stupid, or you can pull over on the shore and take. I mean, it doesn't matter. So that's kind of cool. Uh, we got a couple comments here. We're going to get to fishing here in just a sec. Let's see what we got. Uh, oh, we got, you know, Eric Gellerman, Chattanooga in the house. Well, if you know him or not. Uh, what Eric. else? I don't. How are you, Eric? Oh, here's, here's, I think this is Junior, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. That's my youngest one. Now, Be careful, little buddy. <laughs> Be careful. I, I hear uh, through the grapevine that Blaze is uh, a little bit of a stud on the mound, huh? Yeah, he loved to play baseball. I mean, you know, there's a little well, bit of pedigree there. He's actually going to college now at Boise State and oh, great. graphics design so that – us poor fishing guides, right? Yes. And I got to have to do everything for ourselves. He's going to, uh, he's going to be my graphic designer. Oh, that's, that's that'd be a great website builder, by the way. That's out of Minnesota. I got to give him a little plug. Yeah, we're, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give the link to your website too, because it's, it is a very good website. Um, let's see. Oh boy, it looks like the whole family's in the house. Uh, <laughs> there, people, <laughs> life. <laughs> so uh we had somebody uh so, oh it looked like stormy was on there saying hi for a minute but he disappeared stormy, so you know stormy right yeah he should probably go to bed um he's got right. kids, young kids yeah no oh, yeah yeah so uh all right so i got some uh let's go to uh your your i don't know call it your day job or whatever but this is off at your website actually I mean, that's a that's a pretty killer front page for your website. So uh, Mel is also you've been an outfitter since what was in the 90s sometime in, in Idaho. Yeah, 2000s. OK, OK. So it's Lewiston, Idaho. Right. And and it was kind of a joint deal with you and your dad initially, correct? Kind of partners there for a while. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, you know, we got a nice team built up. You're looking at a boat there that we wrapped last year for one of our full-time guides, Tom Bullock, who you happen to know. I know Tommy very well, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, he, Tom actually kind of weighed in on the, the process of building 
in designing that wrap, which I thought was really cool. And he put my dad on the side of it, which is yeah. really special. That must have been a, a misty eyed moment there. Uh, so, uh, so you guys have a pretty awesome fishery and, and what, what town would you say, what, what are you guys based in? I know you fish all over, but what, what would you say home base is? Well, most of our guys live in in the Lewiston Clarkston Valley, all right, okay. in Idaho. A uh, couple of them live up as Stormy that you know, Brian Miller. They live up in Orfino, which is forty five uh, miles upriver on Highway Twelve. But and I got a couple. I got one over in in Tri Cities, and then one on the on the West Coast. So okay. it allows our company to cover the Pacific Northwest and hit you know hit the uh, the bigger tributaries, the bigger main stem of the Columbia and up the snake. And, but we spend most of our time on the Clearwater river, about seven months fishing for salmon and steelhead right there in our backyard. Like that. Yeah. And, and the steelhead fishing, I mean, I hear it from, from you and Tom and stormy and all these guys that I know that, that work for you. Uh, you know, one of them will say, you know, I'll get a text or something. Ah, you know, fishing kind of sucked today. You know, we were 16 for 22 or something. And, and I, you know, and, and and some days are insanely better than that. I mean, some of the numbers have uh, just blown my mind. And the size of the fish, I guess that's a B run right there, right? That is a B run, which is uh, two to three uh, salt fish. There's another 20 plus pound uh, fish. And you know what's crazy is that that fish there was caught in January, uh, which, you know, in the world of, of steelhead, you have your summer run and, you know, your winter run fish. That that fish is in really good shape. And, yeah. So know, our guys what, are what does uh, – so for steelhead in your neck of the woods, I know fall and winter for sure, right? I mean, is there what, – what's, what's prime time for your steelies? My favorite time is January. Okay. And, you know, you start to get some melt off and the rivers get <clears throat> a little, you get that nice kind of green glacier color. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the fish, the bigger fish seem to come in. They tend to hole up in the deeper holes. Those are the days that, you know, when you're talking to stormy and bully and those guys where they're whacking 20, 30 fish and, you know, October is such a great month too, because the fish are really fresh into our system. And the nicer weather, too, I would imagine. Nice, great weather, T-shirt weather. Those fish get into the riffles. You know, you're fishing shallow water. Really is different. You know, and each month kind of presents different fishing. The fish react different. And, you know, the river flows are different. The weather's different. Yeah. And I like January. I mean, other than the weather, it's, it's a great month. And we've had three or four pushes of fish up in there. Man, you can... You can have some big days, and the big fish are there in January. Wow, that's cool. The other thing that I think sounds just amazing, especially coming from California, where there's you know somebody on every rock typically, is you know again Tom or Stormy, one of those guys will say, "Ah, uh, yeah, I caught 48 steelhead today, and I uh, didn't see another boat." I'm like, what? <laughs> what planet are you fishing on, man? Yeah. We're, hey, JD, we're, we're really spoiled. I'll have to get get you out there one day. But absolutely, you know, it, it's a permit based river. As an outfitter, you know, you have to go to Coast Guard class, and yep. you have you have to pass tests, and and you have to be you're sanctioned by a guide board. So, okay. with that being said, we had to purchase a permit. There's only like eight eight permits out there. On each permit, we get three guides, and okay. so we do a really really good job of controlling boat traffic. Nice. And of course, you know, the, the public, the local people, they're, uh, they're going to fish, but That's you know, the guides were, you know, we hit and run a lot and we cover lots of parts of the river and there's so much of it that gets, you know, untapped unless you're a fishing guide, which it's very competitive, but yeah, well. there are, there are times in the middle of the week, you know, you can cover eight to 10 miles of river with your clients and, you know, you won't see any other guide boats. You'll see guys on the bank. Yeah, they don't, they don't get in your way. They and they catch fish, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. So uh, you guys also, there's Tom again, uh, fish, fishing Sh Chinook. What at Hanford or somewhere? Where's that? He's up at. Uh, I think he's at Drano there. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that might be Drano over near the you know the John Day uh, yeah. or the Dallas. And these guys. You know, while I'm off doing my baseball thing, they're back home, you know, representing the company and fishing year round and trying to make a living. Yeah. Uh, 
and they're they're really good. It's a great team. Well, and 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 to speak to that, I I obviously have spent a lot of time with Tom and Stormy guiding in Alaska, and uh, both. I mean, equally as good uh, as anglers as they are. Well, they're actually better humans probably than anglers even, but they are amazing. I mean, they're really, really, really top notch fishermen. And, uh, you know, and then goes without saying that they're, uh, uh, you, you know, as good or better as humans. I mean, they're really good dudes. So you got quality. I don't know all your guys, but those two for sure are, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're picking the right dudes, draft yeah. right players. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It, it sounds funny. And look, these guys, you know, there's a lot of great companies out there that they could go to work for. Sure. And I know when my dad and I talked about, you know, developing a fishing brand and it, it starts with your people. Yep. You know, it starts with your fishing guides. And we really sought after a, a certain type of guide that would possess those qualities, of, you know, the human being qualities of getting in and not making it just another guy today. And people that care and they work their butts off. These guys work hard, man. They do. They're dedicated to their fishery. You know, they're dedicated to the company. They have passion for what they do. They study it. They mm -hmm. talk it and Live it. Yeah. They're great examples. They're, they're just, I'm proud. I'm proud of our guys. I love them. Yeah, you should be. Um, and it's, I mean, from talking to them without you in the room, uh, you know, they say, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a mutual love fest because uh, you take good care of them. sounds like. And I know you said that if any of them got in trouble during this whole thing that you'd help them. And I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that's going on here. It sounds like a family more than a company, which is, which is cool. That's why people should go fishing with your guys. Now, uh, uh, we'll get more comments here. So let's, uh, let's see what we got going here. Uh, take me to walleye. <laughs> JP Tam wants, wants us to cut to it. Uh, Mel's nephew, uh, checking in. Who's this? BC and boy, BC boys. You know who that is? Jacob. Hmm. Oh, that might be Jake. Yes. That's my wife's uh, nephew out of Georgia. Well, there you go. Oh, geez. I, this. I just. I, I, go mm -mm. Dodgers. Mm -mm. Oh, Larry Lund. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Uh, Larry. Shouldn't, shouldn't he even. Shouldn't he even said that. Uh, here's a. Here we go. This must be a. So. Well, my man, you know, we, we do a, a charity tournament every December. This guy's at the forefront of getting crazy, loves the fish, could come over, have a good time on the clear water for three days and uh, spends a lot of money with us. I love you, Tommy Gaynor. Nice. And, oh, just a bunch of guys. Oh, <laughs> Tony Davidson, only 48 Steelies. Come on, man. <laughs> it's a rare day. That's not every day, but it, it happens. Those guys are good. Those young bucks are good, man. Yeah, they got that uh, that desire. So before we we get on to uh, too far off track here, you also uh, these what are they? Hell's Canyon. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, Sturgeon. Tom Bullock there uh, up the Hell's Canyon Sturgeon. They fish them for about nine months. Get up to eleven foot. It's insane. Uh, I, Tom yeah, says. I got it. It's, in, it's incredible. And then the, the one that uh, trip that really sounds interesting to me is I think this is again during baseball season, but uh, Tom says he's doing these smally sturgeon combos up there. So that's uh, union catches a hundred small mouths a day, you know, <laughs> and get a handful of oversized sturgeon with some shakers. Uh, man, it, I mean, it's, it really, you know, if you haven't been in Hell's Canyon, it really is like another part of the world. It's, yeah. it's a different experience, and it's right in our backyard. It's crazy. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, it, it, it sounds like it's just otherworldly. And I, I imagine the boat ride. I mean, you don't even have to fish. The boat ride's got to be mm -hmm. epic. But on to a, a topic that's probably nearest and dearest to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, marble eyes. <laughs> Well, that fish way right there, by the way. Love me a bug eye. That's that fish was actually that's not my best, <clears throat> but that fish will push fifteen pounds. Oof, God, that's a bigger. fucking devil, isn't she? That that fish was caught in January. 
Wow. Swan is in March, and uh -huh. I know it's different everywhere. You know, those water temperatures get 46 to 48. Yeah. Uh, we were fishing about 41, 42 degree temperatures over near the Tri-Cities. Uh-huh. Where the state record come out of, which was I think twenty pound, twenty plus pounds, and uh, we're basically fishing in those waters. We were uh, jig fishing that particular day. Super slow, cold weather, you know, just well before uh, pre spawn. And I was out with one of my other fishing guides, actually uh, my fishing, my walleye guru, Jeremy Eubank. Cool. Well, that's that's just a. I mean, the lighting's cool too, but that's just a, that's a, that's a fish that makes me want to go catch walleye. Here's another good one. Um, not quite as big. So do you know how, um, Columbia or, uh, walleye got in the Columbia? Is it just somebody dumping them? I heard they come from back in, I want to say, and I, I've studied them. I've spent so much time on this unpredictable finicky <laughs> ghostly stealth stealthy fish that I, like I think back in the 40s and uh i think they came over from the great lakes yeah if I'm mistaken and i caught my first walleye on the columbia river i was smallmouth bass fishing back in the 70s mm. by mistake yeah. didn't even know what a walleye was right caught him on a beetle spin <laughs> with my dad you know, around some structure, six to eight foot of water. And okay. when I caught this thing, I did not know what it was, nor did I know this thing was about to hook me <laughs> for a lifetime. Long, you <laughs> know, this long drawn out process of trying to get to know Mr. Walleye. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, so uh, the world record 25 pounder, 1960, Old Hickory, Tennessee. Um, and that was, a uh, God, the, what's the guy's name? I can't remember. He had the coolest name. It kind of sounded like a, a baseball name. Uh, what was his name? Oh, well, I knew the name too. Yeah. Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, but, and, and it's interesting because this fish, uh, IGFA international game fish association recognizes it as the all tackle world record walleye at 25 pounds, even, um, the national freshwater fishing hall of fame has, um, dis disallowed it for some, I guess there was, you know, they think there's some, some backstory that doesn't, uh, isn't really becoming. And uh, um, I don't know. They, I don't know why, but uh, that, that leads to the question is the next world record walleye in the Columbia somewhere. I, I really feel confident in saying that that fish is swimming around there. <clears throat> and I promise you when I get done with baseball, <laughs> I will do everything in my power. <laughs> to chase what I think might be that that world record. You're, you, yeah. you you have a date with that young lady, huh? I, I do, and uh, I'm not gonna quit. You know, uh, I, I love to walleye fish, and uh, it, it's a passion of mine. I know in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we're thought of more of steelhead and salmon anglers, yeah. which all of my guides love. But uh, there's something about the walleye. You know, I looked at that fish. And my, my first instinct was, is if my brother caught that fish and you don't know my brother, I would have to cut that belly open. <laughs> I can tell you during fishing tournaments, yeah, because we weigh our fish, my brother's notorious for like cramming things down the fish's belly to get more weight on the fish. So <laughs> that, that was a sagging belly. Oh yeah. That, um, well, to put it in perspective, okay, think about, especially in, in the last several years, even up in Togiak, where I work with uh, with your guys, a 25-pound Chinook is a big is a big fish now. I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the average size of kings everywhere seems to be doing this. And you catch a 25-pounder, it's a, it's a big animal. And you think about a walleye at 25 pounds, holy mackerel, that's a, that's a fish. That's a big fish. And, you know, I've, I've been really fortunate to walleye fish all over the United States. Spent a lot of time back in, the, you know, in the Detroit and Lake Erie and Mille Lacs and some really wonderful walleye fisheries. And, you know, then we have the Columbia River. It's 
you just think about all the feed. And I know the, the salmon and walleye guys don't like hearing this, but right. you know, the smoke, the, the, yep. bats, the feed, there's plenty of food and bluegills and crappie. And it's, you know, they live there year round. They are a little bit migratory, mm -hmm. but there's plenty of feed and plenty of, of deep enough water for them to escape to get big. And so it's perfect. It's perfect habitat. Now there's not going to be as many walleye as there is typically going to Lake Erie. You know, I got some buddies out there that, I mean, it's nothing for them to go out and get 30, 40 walleye in a couple hours and they're beautiful fish. They're, you know, eight, 18 inches up to 10 or 11 pounds. And, but those guys back in Minnesota, when they hear me talk about these fish in the middle teens to upper teens, and you know, I've got one 18 and a half. Wow. They can't, they're in like disbelief, but we don't have as many fish right. as they do. And, and, and that's not going to happen either in the Columbia. You know, we put too much money and time into our, our, our field. It's not going to happen. It could be, but it's not going to. Right, right. And that's, that's kind of the same thing down here. If we actually put more energy into striped bass, we'd have tons of them. And that's the one thing I'm surprised. You know, the, the American shad run that's in the Columbia came from original plant in the Sacramento. I'm surprised the stripers haven't found their way into that lower Columbia, but good Lord, they'd get fat in that sucker. They would get fat, yeah. I'm sure a few have wandered through. Um, uh, oh, real quick, uh, steelhead question for you. Is the Clearwater going to have a steelhead season next year? Yeah, Brad, I just talked to uh, Joe DuPont with Fish and Game. Matter of fact, yesterday, just trying to get the numbers and – they're collecting the pit tags and all of that here shortly with the steelhead return coming back. And they're forecasting, you know, a run that's going to allow us to fish in the fall all the way through the winter. And, you know, as you know, last fall, uh, our season was shut down to let broodstock to get back to the hatcheries. And we didn't get to start fishing until January 1. So expect a, you know, probably a size restriction, maybe with a one fish harvest. I'm not fishing game. I'm not making that official announcement, but just based on the conversations. Uh, so we should get our fishery back. Cool. That's good news. Cause I know that was a, that was a tough one for you guys last year. So, um, all right. So walleye, um, springtime, the best time on the Columbia or, or what's, what's the deal? It is, you know, it's, it's, and there's guys fish it year round, but when you think about springtime, you know, you're thinking about pre-spawn and you're thinking about big fish. The, you know, the, the river fishing for walleye is a little bit different than reservoirs. And the one thing that I've learned about walleye is <clears throat> they'll learn these spawning places from the larger ones. And actually, the smaller ones will actually follow the larger ones into these spawning grounds. Mm. And they like to spawn in the shallow waters and they like 46 to 48 degree temperatures to where they start thinking about spawning. And that's where they do their spawning in that shallow water. <clears throat> and then millions of eggs are laid, you know, and, uh, and then so that process starts. So the, the pre-spawn is really the big time is the time that we get the big fish. So for me, I have to go back to baseball in February. Right. But when I get done with that, you know, early to middle January, I'm going to start, you know, isolating these areas that I know these fish are headed to and try to get on them. And, you know, that's that's when they start to do the thing. Post spawn, you know, the males start spreading out. They'll move into the deeper water and you're more apt to get numbers and the male fish than you are the females uh and the females are when when you get the you know the pre-spawn fish right um so do are, are walleye broadcast spawners or do they dig a nest how do they i don't i don't know how they uh yeah they it, they're it's kind of like bass you know they love sand they love gravel really and uh you know i think don't quote me on this but maybe a you know a million fish will will hatch from a from one fish wow so maybe wow. You know, and you got the water that raises and all the other things that, you know, go with a spawned fish. So the beautiful thing about a walleye is it's not going to die after it spawns. Right. But typically, once they spawn in an area and you catch a big fish and you happen to release it, you have a really good chance of going back there in the next couple of years unless somebody has harvested it 
and really wow. catching that fish when it even becomes bigger. Wow, that's cool. Because they are a little bit creature of habits, and they will return into those same spawning grounds, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that really is. It's uh, sort of just they've got their little home there, and that's that's where they go. Interesting. So uh, I, I know, I, you know, you got the uh, the worm harness kind of stuff. And does anybody use leeches out out west here? We can't. No live bait except uh, night crawlers. So oh. guys out on on Erie in the Midwest, they're using leeches and minnows. Wow. you know, with hair jigs and stuff like that. So but we could use night crawlers and that's the extent of live bait. I guess that's uh, to keep people from using smolts on there. Right, you... they get enough live bait is that's that bait right there. The, uh, the crawler harness undoubtedly it's kind of foolproof. Mm -hmm. It's great for searching for walleyes covering walleye or covering lots of water and Walleye will hit on that year round. You know, it's it's other than the mistake of me catching that walleye for the first time on a spinner, uh, which you still have. You have a smile blade, which right. things pulsating and creating a wobble when you have your night crawler. You know, that's you can catch walleye year round. There's a photo from uh, one of our fishing guides that's showing you the two red beads with the smile blade. And, you know, the, the guys will use different blades. Sometimes they'll use a Colorado blade. They'll use bigger blades, smaller blades, smile blades, sometimes no blade. And they'll go to a slow death hook and just like one of those red beads. And all of those decisions kind of are based on water flow, time of year. You know, it's like everything, steelhead fishing. Uh, there's times they're... They'll hit bobber dog and boon dog and side drift and back troll and they're in different sections of water, resting, feeding, uh, a lot of different things that go into walleye fishing. Those uh, the smile blades are cool because they'll they'll turn in just about a whisper a current. Whereas if you're dragging a Colorado or something, it's going to be uh, you're going to have to go a little faster, I would imagine. Yeah, and that's you know the smile blades have become really popular the last five years with walleye guides, and you know we 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 target a lot of like frog water right on really the break line of of the river, and we get in that softer water, and we'll actually troll down river and try to go as slow as like. 0 0.8, 0 0.7 miles an hour uh -huh. where keep that rod at a nice 45 degree angle. And just that thing is barely spinning. And then there's times fish are aggressive, right? Sure. Or crank baits and, or you can speed your, your troll up. And so there's so much, you know, the fascinating thing about walleye is, uh, and you don't have to be an expert to catch them. And there's times like when they're on flats and they're feeding, it's like everybody catches them. Yeah. But the fascinating thing for me is like fishing for these things year round and learning like the times that they're not up on a flat feeding, where they go, what their, you know, <laughs> tendencies are, reaction bites and and studying that part. That's the fascinating part. It's not the the bite or the tug right. from the walleye, but it's kind of for me the chase. Sure. And, sure. You know, there's days you think you're, man, you're the best angler out there. You got them, you got them whipped. And yep. then you go back to the same spot two days later and you get your butt kicked. Yeah. You hit a three run bomb the next, next day you got a hat trick. So uh, my young starters go through that same thing. They'll throw a yeah. shutout, right? Yeah. Hero to zero. Got to figure it out. Get out there. Somebody game plan against you. Your stuff's not the same. And all of a sudden, uh oh, uh, I got a breakout plan B. That's that's the plight of the fishing guy daily too, <laughs> you know. What have you done? I, who cares if you limited out yesterday? What what are you going to do for us today? Especially, uh, guiding, especially guiding. Yeah, oh man. That's, that's you. You got different clients coming in. It's like you got to be on your game every day. The pressure of that. You know what that feels like. Absolutely. So you mentioned trolling. Uh, well, you're trolling. Uh, going back real quick, just so people understand, with these these rigs here. Uh, with the night crawler threaded on there, you're you're trolling with a. Are you using a bottom walker sinker or three way? What how how are you doing that? Yeah, I'm using. You know, it's it's referred to as a Lindy Lindy rig. So oh, Lindy rigs area. 
Right, Lindy Rig. So actually, you know, a lot of my education come from back with Al Linder and guys like that. So mm -hmm. I learned a lot of walleye fishing from in Fisherman magazine. Oh, I used to read all that stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. But anyway, yeah, you you know, you got anywhere from a three to four and a half foot leader, and uh, you're using a you could use either a sliding like a slider with a uh, bottom bouncer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the depending on the, the length of the, uh, you'll see a little wire hanging off on the end of those things. Uh, sometimes if you're in just sandy and there's not a lot of structure and weed and stuff like that, guys will use the shorter ones. And, but, so you, you want to be down near the bottom. Right. And it just, it really depends if you're, Obviously, if you're targeting moving fish or, you know, fish that are suspended and you're fishing 40, 50 foot of water and they're suspended up at 30, 30 feet, you're obviously not going to fish this, this technique. Right. But most of the time, 90% of the time, walleye are going to be near the bottom. Yep. There has to be bait around. Mm -hmm. And that bottom walker just like side drifting with steelhead, you want to be ticking the bottom. You don't want to be dragging the bottom, but you want to be just ticking along yeah. in those floats and those beads uh, just next to the smile blades are going to help float that up off the bottom. So, you know, you're trying to stick that bait in that, that fish's face and that slow presentation with that that Lindy rig with that crawler harness really allows you to cover a lot of water and do just that. Yeah, and that's that's a good point. That uh, it's a simple one, and it's so kind of obvious to uh, those of us that do this every day. But um, I, I tell people on the boat this all the time, and they kind of go, "Oh, never thought of that." But um, the, the the purpose of those floats is to get your stuff up in the water column just a little bit because fish see up way better than they see down so uh you want to err on the side of having it above their head than below their head so that's where those floats come in handy just just a little you know that's a good tip for kind of all all fishing um let's see we got some more some more uh questions here oh geez <laughs> this one this was this is a guy on my uh my baseball team he says we need more pitching <laughs> <laughs> so, <Who are> rebels? <laughs> oh you don't want to know who the rebels are <laughs> it's the biggest cast of out uh, outcasts you've ever yeah. seen but, <laughs> but i was uh, a i was a rebel i was a unlv uh, all right right and i still got some rebel in me there you go well uh if you ever want to pitch me pitch. Oh, okay <laughs> right um uh, so uh sorry jake uh no no recruiting today um so the blade bait, this seems to be, uh, God, that's, those are old school lures and they've seemed to really make a comeback, at least on the Columbia. What, uh, when are you throwing those? Are you trolling them or how are you fishing those things? Well, you can fish them a lot of different ways and you can vertical fish them. Uh huh. And when you have marked on your graph, maybe some structure, you know, you have a little, under, you know, an island down there with some grass and some rocks and stuff, and you have a pot of fish. Uh, you ran into them. Maybe you're searching with your uh, crawler harness, and you marked on your graph, or you got into a fish, you know, a bunch of them. That's what typically I put on my spot lock on my uh, – Minn Kota. Yep, on my Minn Kota. And then I would go to, I love the blade baits. They're, it, it's really a great uh, technique and a great lure for when the fish start to spread out or when the males start to spread out and then they start going on these humps post-spawn. And like I said, you can, you can vertical fish them mm -hmm. where you're given little short jerks. You can do a, like a, a short twitch and a retrieve. Uh, you can do the, you know, this, the long pull, this five foot aggressive pull up and then control your fall on the way down. They pulsate, they vibrate. And when they hit, most of the time, the walleye is going to hit that bait just when it kind of settles. 
-huh. And is the reason I like to control that fall, that, that, that bait on the way down because, and when they hit it, they hit it hard. Yeah. That crawler, that crawler harness, most of the time, you know, they give what you call a walleye nudge where they'll let you know they're there. They'll kind of play with the, you know, the, the, the worm before they commit. But with the, uh, the blade bait, it's a, it's such a reactionary, you know, impulsive bait. I think it ticks them off. You know, it, it mimics a, a wounded mi uh, minnow. <laughs> Small. And they cannot, they cannot resist. And it's a great way, like I say, to vertical fish, or even in areas where walleye are kind of isolated around and they're aggressive and I'm twitching this thing, I'm letting it fall. I'm twitching. I'm letting it fall. I'm keeping them short. I'm, I'm getting one, mixing a long one in there, controlling that fall. And if they're chasing bait during that time, that's a great way to get them. I love to, to blade bait. And one of the pictures that you showed up on the screen was a guy that, uh, has developed a company, a blade bait that guy? right there. That's the man. And so his company's called Vertical Jigs, and he just developed a new blade bait that actually sits on that water a little different than other ones. And there's lots of great blade baits out there, but I like this one a lot. How, and it's, they're called Vertical? Yeah, it looks like it says that. Vertical on Jigs. Vertical Jigs. I'm sure you can find that online. Um, what's the biggest they make those things? How heavy? I'm thinking Tahoe would be kind of interesting to try them yeah, out. You know, m most if I'm over, if we're over on Potholes Reservoir, mm -hmm. which is the lake, right. right? There's no, there's no, no rivers flowing. Uh, we're fishing a lot of you know eight to twenty foot water. We'll cast quarter ounce ones and stay with a little lower profile in the Columbia River where you have lots of flow and. Yeah. Yep. break lines and depth and you're on the edges of structure we'll use a lot of three quarter ounce so three quarter ounce five eighths even up to an ounce you know is a, a really popular size and uh you know that gives you a chance to get down get down to the bottom and keep that bait in that zone a little bit longer which is important yeah yeah so they make them at least up to an ounce, huh? They do, and there's some heavier ones too. Mm. Look, we fish. I, I don't like it, but I've caught fish in 80 foot of water. Wow. Yeah, I don't like doing that because then the fish come up and their eyes are already all, you know, they're bugged yeah. out anyway, but they're hot oh, <laughs> Exactly. So, but we catch a lot of fish in 30 to 50 foot of water with these blade baits, with jigs. Wow. And it's a very common depth. And usually they're right on the edge of their resting water, that deeper water, mm -hmm. and a ridge line of a flat. Yeah. And we'll get resting fish when they slide up on that hump. You know, it's like back bass fishing yep. with a with a jig and letting that thing fall. Yeah, they get up, uh, go up on. I mean, just like we were last week, we we're talking about striped bass and same thing. They hang out deep, and I guess <laughs> think about most fish really hang out deep, come up and make a raid in the shallows and get back out of dodge before, uh, before they feel too nervous. So, um, that's interesting. So, uh, you got, uh, uh some pictures here of, uh, trolling some crankbaits too. Uh, I know the, the, the original one that I used to always see in the, the Cabela's and, you know, Bass Pro catalogs were the reef runners and looks like, uh, yeah, they were always real big, deep build, uh, all the walleye bugs kind of long and slender. And this looks, I don't know what bait that is, but, uh, kind of fits that same profile and seems like that's the the walleye plug de jour isn't it the uh, the long skinny deep diver yeah that's a bandit uh and you know there's lots of great plugs out there reef runner uh, you mentioned reef runner it's uh actually my web the guy that built my website actually built reef runner's website so oh. a company i'm super familiar with and you know a lot of times walleye anglers they go in and and when they're in the process of buying uh, plugs and lures, it's most of the time they, they end up catching us, right? They get our eye, but right. <laughs> I'll tell you the one thing I learned, uh, you know, about crankbaits and it's, it's all about 
you know, getting in that water column. It's, it's like anything. It's no different than back trolling salmon and making sure, you know, that you're getting moving fish and being on that level. But again, the time of the year, the depth, uh, if that particular lure there will dive down in the mid twenties, if there's fish at 40 to 50 foot, you know, we have to put, uh, clip line weights mm. or, you know, lead core line yeah. to get that bait down. If, if we like that bait, there's times that we'll fish a stick bait, you know, and that fish bait typically 80 foot of line back there is going to swim six to 15 feet. Mm -hmm. but we're down the fish are down at 40 feet. Well, we got to get that bait down there. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, you'll see the lips and the different depths that they, that they dive. But, the one thing I found out about walleye, and, and they are a, you know, they're a predator fish, is, you know, and they've always, we've always heard about, you know, big bait, big fish. Well, there's a lot to be said for that. My bigger fish have come on those big plugs, yeah. you know, those big long plugs, those 13s that uh, have a lot of profile through the water. And it's murky water, there's river, there's flows, there. You know, and sometimes it's a battle if you're a fish down there to, to get that bait. And they're when they want to feed, man, they're aggressive. Yeah. Like any other fish. Um, and, and is there a time of year that uh, that trolling the deep divers makes more sense than others? Well, we, we use a lot. It, it does. And, you know, it's like anything. There's a there's a point that the fish will get. I don't want to say non-responsive, but they'll go into their winter grounds where the water temperature is cold. And they're not feeding as often. And that's that's the time you have to stick something in their face. Mm -hmm. So when you think about trolling, you know, we're going to go one and a half to two miles an hour. It's kind of an aggressive zigzag. And we're trying to strike, a you know, an impulsive reactionary bite. And there's certain times of the year that you're going to do that. You think about springtime when the fish are a little more aggressive. Sure. Wintertime, it's, it's more you know, jigs are slowing down with that crawler harness, trying to stick something in that fish's face and leave it in that zone as long as you can. Those crankbaits, you know, they're, they're a wonderful bait when the fish are moving into their spawning grounds and even post spawn when the males are aggressive. That's, that's a fun time. I love to, to pull and troll crankbaits because what, as I noted with the crawler harness, you know, it's such a subtle little soft bite and you get to, you feel that nudge. And with the, uh, with the crankbaits, it's such a different bite. It's much more aggressive. Yeah. So, um, when, when they bite that, that plug, is it, uh, like with Kings, you say, Hey, let them take it a little bit or do they grabbing it out of the holder or what's, what's the procedure on the, the hook set? Yeah. It's, it's unlike steelhead and Kings where you have to, you know, if you look at those rods on salmons and steelhead and you're back trolling or you're, you get your flashes out, it's it's a medium action. It's soft, so it won't pull away from that fish, right? Right. You have to assure that that thing is pumping, that, you know, that rod's pumping and it's hooked. With walleye, it's a different – it's just like smallmouth. Mm. When they grab – when you're trolling, a you know, a, a, a Rapala or Shadrap or uh, – you know, all those other crankbaits, or if you're retrieving them fast, when they hit, they hit it. And there is no letting go. There's there's nothing soft. So we use fast action rods mm -hmm. and it's an immediate hookup. Really? Most of the time when you hook up with that bandit, uh, with those treble hooks, it's a done deal. You lose you lose the very and they they inhale it. You know, a lot of times you'll find all three sets of hook in that fish. So <laughs> So what's the uh, what's the is there a standard limit on the Columbia or is it slot, slot limit or anything? Oh, they went to they went to well, Nelson, didn't they? Yeah, there's uh, there's no limit. Yeah. No limit. So there's I don't need to publicize that. I guess yeah. there's uh, there, there's no limit, but for the guys, for the for the few walleye guides that make you know guiding for walleye their living. Mm -hmm. You know, they practice they practice the the catch and release with the brood stock and the bigger fish. You know, when they, they start getting up in that 26 to 28 inches, we let the fish go. Now the salmon and steelhead guides, they want those fish out of there. Yeah. And, and 
as does, you know, fish and game and all that. So it's such a delicate little political thing we don't need to get into, but uh, yeah. So, you know, we, we, when we take people out, it, we explain to them and we practice, you know, releasing the larger fish. We, we take the photos, we weigh them. And if they want to get it, get it mounted, we steer them in the right direction to that. And look, if, you know, if, if it, you know, push comes to shove and they have to take the fish home, it's, it, it's their fish. So yeah, it's, they have their legal right. But yeah, we, same thing, uh, you know, down here with the striped bass, you know, the, and I'm a salmon and steelhead guy, just like you are. So we're, we straddle both sides of the fence, but I'm also a striped bass guy. And, and, you know, I'm sure it's the same on the Columbia as it is here. Striped bass and, and probably walleye are not the, the cause of the demise of our salmonids. I mean, if you want, really want to look hard, it's, it's not the stuff that humans are doing, not, not what the walleye and striper is doing. Yeah. But. Yeah, that's, you, that's a whole nother. You hit it on the head, and it's it's for another day. But you know, the walleye been around forever, and so the smallmouth in the Columbia. Yeah, and these younger guys, I respect what they're doing. They're wonderful. They're great. But you know, I've been fishing oh, the, back in the '60s and '70s, and you know, I, we can go into smallmouth bass too. Can you have both? You know, I, we need to do a better job with our, our hatcheries for our salmon and steelhead. And as you noted, there's so many other factors that are just, you know, some battles that we're up against. But, uh, well, I mean, all you really have to do is look back to, like you say, the 60s or so. Even when I was coming up, when I started guiding in 98, I mean, we had in the Sacramento River system in, oh, it was 92, I think. Uh, 92? I, I don't know. It's been a while. But uh, we, we had a return of uh, almost 800,000 Chinook, and we had huge striper runs. I mean, you go back to those those old days when, you know, when probably your your pops was, you know, walleye fishing even before you. Uh, there were a lot more salmon and steelhead, and there were plenty of walleye and striped bass and smallmouth. And so I, I find it hard to believe that, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, you're not going to argue with the fact that walleye eat smolts. I don't argue with the fact that stripers eat smolts. That's, I mean, that's a fact, but is it the cause? No. I mean, in your case, they could run the dams way better. The hatcheries. I mean, it's, you know, that we could do three shows. I, I, you know, like you, you guide year around. Yep. And you have to do it all. Yeah. Right. In this day and age, because look, we're going to have down years returns on our, our salmon and steelhead. All right. And you got to make a living and you got to resort to other things. So a lot of our guides in the Pacific Northwest are doing just that. Right. You know, I'm really, my wish is like to, to be able to get the salmon and steelhead back and, and make some adjustments there to where we could have both because, you know, guides need to fish. They don't make enough money in that short time that we get the salmon and steelhead fish that, you know, we could have a wonderful walleye fishery as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And we do. Perfect world, right? It is. We got, we got to adjust somehow. Um, so uh, what else? Uh, anything else we need to cover on Wild? I'm sure you'd go on for days. But uh, so uh, spring, now uh, we're coming into summer. Are they still catchable this time of year, going all through summer? Yeah, really good numbers. You know, they'll, they'll start to spread out. Obviously, they, they'll move out of their spawning grounds. Yeah. So when I think of spawning grounds, I think of, you know, little at the mouth of tributaries. Shallow water, lots of bait, structure, places they can get up and they can lay their eggs. And then, and they're a migratory fish. Mm -hmm. So then when, after that takes place, you know, a month later, after their babies hatch, they'll start to move out in some deeper water and they'll start to spread out a little bit. And their, their moods, they kind of, they kind of change. And uh, you could you could still get some really good numbers. You could still find you know congregating walleye and big bunches. Mm -hmm. You can still find them over humps, uh, but they'll just spread out a, a little more. It, it's kind of like the steelhead hatcheries. You know, they're all heading up into an area to spawn, and guess what? Back down in the spring, out in the ocean, and spread out. So. You know, they live in the Columbia year round. They, uh, you know, I, I, I had a, I had a walleye guy one time tell me from out West, 
And this really made me think about walleye and, and study them. He says, you know, 90% of the walleye live in 10% of the water. Mm. So while I'm telling you that fish are going to spread out, it, it doesn't mean that they're going to use a lot, utilize the entire, you know, 400 and something miles of the Columbia River. Right, right. They're still going to go, you know, that three to five miles from where they were spawning, and but they're going to spread out. They're going to spread out where there's feed. Yeah. They have to have feed, so they're not going in in a hundred foot of water where there's not feed around. Sure, you know they're still going to hang around, you know, where there's perch and bluegill and bass and stuff. So think about that structure and hiding places, and so I, I've learned a lot during the times where walleye fishing becomes a little tougher and you have to search them out and to try to study that, that process. But that's, they, that, that's when you become a better angler right there. And, and, and here's the thing with, you know, unlike salmon and steelhead, it's like you can pick their routes out, right. With walleye and stuff like that, once they start spreading out, they live there year round. They know where, where, you know, to find their feed. Mm -hmm. They what, know what's nearby and they'll, they'll head into those spots. So back to what that guy said, 90% of the walleye live in 10% of the water. And you can waste a lot of time trying to, to search for a walleye and thinking that you're going to go catch a walleye in water that really that fish is probably not going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, the, like you said, early going, it's the uh, it's the hunt that uh, is really you know the chase is half the fun or or more. Uh, so yeah. let's, what uh what else we got uh, we got some more comments here. Let's not get too far behind on that. Uh, well, Larry's checking back in. Need to get him up to the Togiak. Heck yeah, we do. Yeah, that's right. L Larry owns the Togiak, correct? Well, sort of. He's in process of. Uh, selling it hopefully for larry's sake and the, the the larson's sake it's all going through last i heard it was um of course you're gonna have to retire from baseball before you get up there because that's uh yeah i'm not larry i'm not quite ready to give baseball up i got some really young uh pitchers that have a lot of promise that have a chance to do some great things but when that comes mm -hmm. rest assured because yeah. it's been a long time since I've dove back into the salmon fishing, right? Yeah. yeah and these young guys are really good and there's different techniques. I'm kind of, I'm anxious to get, you know, back into that, go to Alaska, go to Canada, hit it all. Yeah. I want to, I want to come out there and hit some stripers with you. My dad got a 52 pound striper. Oof. I know you can put, put me on one bigger. <laughs> yeah. On that. If we go to the East coast. <laughs> right, he got it on the East Coast in Connecticut. Yeah, but, sure, he did. Yeah, yeah. Those are some of the things that I want to do because I, I really like you have a passion for the sport. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's tough when you when you don't have summers off. And so I know a while back you were, you know, it seems like every year kind of like I'm not sure this might be the last year, but now you got some some talent and and seeing some some brightness on the horizon because hasn't uh i hate to say it but haven't the uh the marlins fans kind of uh practiced social distancing for a while <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, just, just from what i've seen oh speaking of that speaking of that I, I, do they still have the fish tank there uh you're you're dirty <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah 105 losses you know here's yeah. the deal yeah so i i signed up for this when when I left Seattle, actually, my dad chose the Miami Marlins for me. How's that? Fair and enough. <clears throat> so, you know, he's part responsible for those 105 losses we took last year. But we're in a we're in a rebuild. Yeah, yeah. And so I can all I can tell you is, you know, you know what paybacks are like, right? Yep. Yeah. And there's going to come a point in time that these guys uh, are going to develop and figure out how to win and get a taste of that. So I'm going to hang around. Wow. I got in at the beginning phases of that rebuild. And this spring, you know, a lot of people didn't pay attention to what the Marlins were doing. And it's granted spring training. But, you know, we had a hell of a record. We were winning lots of games, which that's important. Sure. And so I want to I want to see this thing out. And uh, I'm not ready to to give that up yet. So I'm 56. 
I still got a lot of spunk left in me. I still get my fix with my fishing business and my guiding. And, and I talk to my guides almost every day. And that, that keeps me like, it keeps me going. So yeah. well, that's a, it's not a bad one, two punch, uh, not a bad day job uh, or, or side hustle baseball. So, um, or, or guiding, whichever one's your side hustle, I guess, but uh, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, uh, junior, junior thought uh, the, I guess he's referring to the uh, oh, well. social, social distancing comment, I'm guessing. But uh, so yeah, do, uh, do they still have the big jumping fish out in center field and the, and the fish tank on behind the plate? No, they, they replaced it. <clears throat> they, uh, they did some, some modifications to the ballpark last year, you know, since the new ownership, Derek Jeter come in and, uh, and his group, they've really made a conscious effort to, to do some different things there for when we do get the fans that, you know, you have to win. It's like anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very up in Togiak. If, if, you know, he doesn't put together a great show and yep. lots of fish and bring in the right guides. It's it's you lose your attendance, right? So, right, right. We'll get that back. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's exciting though. I guess on the flip side, I mean, you grind through the the tough times and you see the the light at the end of the tunnel, maybe, and that's got to be got to be exciting to think that maybe you're part of that. So, uh, I think that'd be cool. So speaking of that, uh, so post career, you've uh, mentioned that uh, Stotts Fishing is going to expand to perhaps some things like walleye back east, uh, maybe some peacock bass. Uh, what else you got? Yeah, you know, when when my dad and I, and, and first of all, we didn't envision trying to conquer the fishing world. Right. And we really did. You know, we were very careful in choosing our guides to represent our fish and brand. And really we created some different phases of our business and some different models. And phase four was to take our fishing globally. And <clears throat> we're in the process of doing that. And there's a lot that goes into that, bringing your brand to other parts of the country, making sure you have, you know, the right people in place yep. that would represent your fishing brand and they would fish under our brand. So that's something we're going to do. Uh, I, I probably have to get out of the game to to fully commit to that. Yeah. But I've really enjoyed the process of building our team. And it, you know, first and foremost, it is for our guides. Like our guides that jumped on full time, it's to present more opportunity and give them more diversity within their, their fishing. Yeah. Where I can send them there, just like Alaska. You know, they go up and they go up for six weeks. Well, I could send them over to Lake Erie mm -hmm. for three to four weeks at a time and, you know, put them a bunch of trips and try to, you know, break up the, the monotony of getting stuck in, in places. And as long as they're willing to travel, right. you know, I'm going to create that platform. Yeah. And you can only do that when you have the right, the right guys and, you know, the right, the right program. And so we're close to, to doing that. That's going to get done. Cool. That'll be that'll be interesting. Well, yeah. you get the uh, poolside, uh, you know, cabana living uh, somewhere tropical in the winter uh, when it's all snowy here. You need a peacock bass guide or something. Uh, you know, you know who to talk to. <laughs> you have a guy? Have you got a peacock bass? I haven't, but I, I definitely want to. I, they, yeah. you know, I, I've had uh, you know, you see those Larry Dahlberg videos going down to. The Amazon throwing those giant top water plugs and you know, you got to have 200 pound braid and all that. I mean, that just looks pretty awesome. It does. And I'm down here in Florida where, you know, if things could open up that I could, you know, I could target some of those, uh, you know, yeah, there are a lot of canals and stuff, aren't they? Yeah, there is. And you're right. Just kind of in that around brackish water and kind of like snook, you know, and they're from what I understand, they're, uh, you know, a very ferocious uh, fish when you first first hook up. So they're beautiful. Oh man, yeah. I really I really want to get one, and I, I want to get. You know, I've caught some small stripers, but I really haven't targeted them like like you have. And yeah. you know, I want to make that happen one day too. Sure. Yeah. It's a uh, it's a it's a little bit of addiction, and it's kind of sounds similar to the whole uh, walleye program. So as far as the techniques and, and, you know, kind of what they're doing. So, yeah, uh, you know, think about your striper fishing, like guys for walleye, 
they'll cast and retrieve. You know, I'm sure you've used like rattle traps. Oh yeah. Stuff like that. When there's fish and they're like all over and chasing bait and suspending, it's like things like rattle traps and stuff like that still work. No, I bet. I bet they do. Just like your stripers. They'll I don't know if you're using swim baits for your stripers yet, but we're getting oh. into that now too. Those big ones with the paddle tails and Oh yeah, that's that's been a thing for quite a while. And the big glide baits too. Right. So, um yeah, it's and we were talking the other day about how you like going back east to I mean that's where walleye are from. So that's the epicenter, ground zero to to learn some cool stuff from the the old gurus and same thing here. That's why I love going fishing anywhere different, just to, you know, whether it's up to the OP with Tom's brother or, or wherever. I just it's so cool to go just learn new stuff and new new angles and that you can apply back to your your own fisheries. That's I, I get pretty excited about that kind of stuff. That's the beautiful thing with our sport in, in being able to do that is getting in a boat with somebody else that is so-called the expert in that area. And, you know, I don't know how you are. I know if you fished with me, you would, you know, do probably a lot of listening and, and yeah. watching and, and trial and error, but you would be paying attention. And at some point in time, you would start asking questions for right off the bat. <laughs> so, yep. and, and the reason we do that, you know, it's just like when I get around my young guides, it's like, you know, they do things different than I do. But they're, the fact is they're really, really good. And sometimes they get on to the strangest things that work. And so I want to know so they could help me. Yeah, you know? for sure. Uh, that's yeah. the beautiful thing of fishing man. That in our sport is learning from from guys. And yeah, how they yeah. Do it's it's really cool. So uh, let's see. I got uh, where is it? Here we go. So. Uh, as we talked about before, salmon, steelhead, walleye, smallies, and maybe some other stuff. Uh, if you guys want to go fishing with a really, really, really good crew. I'll tell you what. Here's here's a little side story to tell you what kind of guy Mel is. So I didn't even know him hardly. And I posted a picture of my kid playing baseball. He was 10 or whatever at the time. And Mel sent a message saying, hey, you know, you, something in the photo, you noticed uh, whatever. And he said, hey, send me a video. I mean, he doesn't even know. You know he's never met my kid. And he uh, he says, hey, send me a video. And you put it in your little magic, you know, pitching trainer thing that you use with your, your you know, your pros. And, oh, he's opening up or I don't even remember what it was. But, I mean, I thought that was cool. And I was like, ah, geez, man, that's you got a busy day. You got, can't seriously want to talk more pitching he said man i love kids and and so i thought that was really cool and to this day my 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 son cooper still calls you his personal pitching coach so That's awesome. <laughs> you know it's you think about when you get in a boat you get an opportunity to you know put your stamp on on something and maybe change somebody's life and you know the social media thing while i'd like to try to answer everybody's questions it's you know i try to pay attention to people and yeah. I, I knew who you were and looked into your your books and was fascinated by your you know your writings and some of the things that you've done and some of our guides shared their experience up with you in alaska during that time so uh but i i really do you know most of the time i get away from the baseball scene when i'm guiding in the winter but and there's people that get in my boat that don't even know who i am which which is great yeah, but yeah. if you want to talk baseball, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Right, I've been raised around it my whole life. Had yeah. a dad that did it hit his whole life, and there is you know as much passion as I have for for fishing, uh, I have for baseball. And yeah, uh, my dad took time for us, so I kind of kind of owe it to people, really. Well, that's that's a really cool attitude. Not everybody has that, but uh, that's very cool. And, and, and you're right. I mean, I, I always think about uh, like I have some guide buddies who kind of get into I mean, they're very good and they do what they do and they just kind of have a routine. And then but they always come over to my boat and they're like, huh, what? God, you always got weird stuff going on, you know, <laughs> looking at the rods. And I'm like, that's what keeps it interesting to me. And so if I get tired of talking about fishing techniques and 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 just like you, I guess, you know, if, if the day comes where you're tired of fishing talk or baseball talk, then maybe it's time to adios, you know. And and for me, that, that day isn't coming anytime soon, I know. So. Right. I still do that in the morning when, you know, you put in at the same ramp with your fishing guides. And there's three or four of us lined up. 
when that daylight comes up, first thing I'm doing is I'm looking over my guide's boats. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, if, if we're in stormy section who typically pounds the pink house area and everybody knows that that's kind of that stormy's water up there mm -hmm. and he knows where every rock is. Yeah. So if he's been hammering fish and my boat's next to his and we're waiting on our clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because, and let me tell you, when they get onto something, they don't always let the boss man know. I was going to ask you. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, are you, you going to give me some info here, buddy? <laughs> I do not blame them because we are competitive by nature, right? Well, yes. They want to outdo. They're young. And that's the part that I love about them. But, right. yeah, I'm like you. I'm always looking, man. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I tell people that the biggest, you know, just uh, – amateur at the boat ramp i'm always just kind of at least got an ear pointed because i mean every once in a while there's a little nugget you know that gets dropped i do a lot more listening than talking that's for sure and uh and uh you know kind of the secret little quiet guy in the back just mm, okay mm -hmm. oh you don't say you know and uh and but you know when when fish and i you know there's times when it's appropriate um where I don't have, have too much going on. If I can run a rod, I always tell people, uh, it's the R and D rod. Like this, this rod here is going to have some kooky thing that I thought of at midnight last night, as I was staring at the ceiling. Um, it's probably not going to work and I'm not going to put it on your rods because it's just a crazy harebrained scheme. But every once in a while, these little goofy things work. And so don't mind me. I'm just going to be, you know, mess around with, you know, whatever it is. And sometimes you hit a home run and, 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 and I tell guys like a lot of stuff you're using now originated back here on the R and D rod. So I, you know, I can't run a rod all the time because there's just times where it's not, not uh real handy and you're not doing anybody, you know, you got too much going on. And then if you're focused in fishing, then, you know, you're not giving them the best time, but on days when it's chill or we're just doing something that's relaxed, I don't know, put something out and, and rarely is it anything that's ever worked before, you know, so well, we we used to do that with my dad too. Is the only difference, and I do just that. I'm I'm always fishing something a little different that you know R and D, and hoping that you'll find this little nugget that's going to become this hot thing that's going to take you to the promised land. But next off B or something. But back in the day, when when my brother and I fished with our our dad, you know, and we were on a trip and on a five day trip and we would play games at night cards or backgammon or whatever it was. The loser always had to fish like the ugliest plug in the box. <laughs> yeah. And man, I remember over in the John day river, having to fish the tutti fruity wiggle wart uh, plug, the color that came out that had, you know, eight different colors and there was no way it was going to, and I lit them up. <laughs> with the tutti fruity. It was the only one in the box. Yeah, right. Of course. And my dad bought that plug for the sake of having the loser of, of the game be the penalty plug and have to fish the plug. And <laughs> so you never know, right? You never know. Right. And uh, don't don't try getting it back for me, Dad, either. So uh, here's uh, Roberto Medina, your Yakima Bears. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that – Mr. Medina, left-handed pitcher, uh, super savvy. And Yakima Bears, is that a high school team or what is that? Yakima Bears. That Yakima Bears. So I'm originally from Yakima, right? Right. My, my first coaching experience was with the Yakima Bears. It was an affiliate of the Arizona Diamondbacks Northwest League. Okay. So think of, you know, young college kids going to play baseball for the first time and in the Northwest league and Yakima was one of the, one of the towns mm -hmm. that had a team. It just so happened. I was with the Arizona diamondbacks that the Yakima bears were that affiliate. So my first coaching experience was back in, back in the day with the Yakima bears and, and this guy here pitched for me. Oh, I had cool. not, <clears throat> and I haven't, man, I haven't talked to him or heard from him forever. So glad to see him on here. Yeah, that's cool. Well, thanks for joining us, Roberto. Hope all is well. I don't know if you're still in Yakima or not. Probably not. But uh, no. uh, the Yakima River still have steelhead in it. 
Yeah, they'll still get some up in it, but it's, you know, they're, they're not going to get up into the canyon. And, uh, you know, we, <laughs> we used to chase those things, you know, back duck hunting down through oh. the river valley and, and, you know, catch steelhead probably when we weren't supposed to be. But anyway, I was a young kid and did stupid things. And uh, so, yeah, that, you know, a lot of the runs have, as you know, have dissipated. Yeah. And, uh, I have I, I, theories and thoughts behind them, but, you know, it's tragic. Oh, man. Well, right. on, that, on that note, have you ever, since you're from that part of the world, have you ever seen a book called, and it's it's a big coffee table it's not hard covered, but it's that glossy and it's called a river remembered the Columbia a river remembered. And, uh, I, if I'd been thinking, I would have grabbed it and pulled it out. Uh, have you seen that book? Yeah. My uncle, my uncle Pete, who's from Alaska. Uh-huh. Uh, when he moved down to Lewiston, Idaho, he had that book. Okay. We're talking, this is a big book. It's a big book. And, and just for people who haven't seen it, I mean, again, you know, it's a big sucker. And it's it's basically the Columbia from Astoria up to maybe the Canadian border or more. I don't remember exactly. But um, and I, I'm not even that familiar with that part of the world, but I just dig rivers and, and I picked it up somewhere. I don't even remember where. But um, it's got all these black and white photos of like Celilo Falls and and all the rapids that were on the uh, the Columbia before the dams. And it oh God, it just it makes you sick. I mean, I, I look at it and my stomach hurts thinking. What have we done to this? Just, I mean, what an incredible body of water, and how fertile it was, and and oh man, I know, yeah, you know, progress comes with a price and all that, but man, mm -hmm. you look at those, and you just wish you had a time machine, jet boat, <laughs> you know, and go back and holy smokes, knowing what you know now, and oh, yeah, I mean, the, the numbers of fish that used to, I mean, insane insane amounts that used to go up to Columbia. I read somewhere, maybe it was in that book that they estimated 365 days a year, something like 30 to 40,000 salmonids, you know, steelhead and salmon ascended that thing. And then you had the, what were they, the June hogs that were like, you know, potentially hundred pounds. And that, I mean, we just wiped those completely off the face of the earth and, oh God, just yeah. sickening. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we're in for a long haul. Nah, we really sure. are. Just so many battles that, uh, you know, obviously it's become, become political. But, you know, I was, I've been fishing that river my, my whole life and just seen so many different, you know, turn of events and things change on this river. And I know the world changes. Baseball changes how we view it. But uh, I don't like all of those changes. Yeah, no. you know it takes more than than you and I to to stand up and fight some of these issues. It's boy, we got a tough road. Speaking of changes, uh, I'm gonna guess here. I'm going out on a limb and saying you're not much of a saber metrics guy. I, I mean, I, I feel like you probably come from the old school gut uh, instinct uh, school of baseball. I imagine you have to adapt now, though. Uh, what, what's your how's, what do you feel about all these uh, spin rates and all this? I mean, you I don't know, know what half the acronyms are. Here's, I mean, I, I'm probably one of the older pitchers, and I'm not that old. I don't feel old. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting you know a little gray. Mm -hmm. Is I'm probably one of the older pitching coaches in baseball, and so I've seen a lot. Yep. And the the how the games viewed the, the you know the uh, the numbers. And the values of things that they're putting on, uh, putting on a, a, a different level of of performance to where it's not about the wins and losses, and you, you know making trades based on these things. And there's there's so many new factors. And but here here's the reality of it. it's like I got the best education in the world from a pitching coach that taught me about using my eyes and what I saw, and then having some feel. And being able to make good decisions based on those two things. Sure. Without a computer. So it's, 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 and I still, you know, I do it in fishing. Yeah. I'm in a new body of water. I look at it and I try to break the water down and, and imagine myself being a fish. That's sight, 
and then having some gut, right, based on experiences. Well, then comes sabermetrics, mm -hmm. analytics and numbers, and different ways to to value guys and to try to get, you know, the most out of players and starters aren't going as deep in the game and bullpen guys are more, you know, prevalent than ever and uh, spin rates and – Break starter, uh, not and, starter. What, what's the uh, opener? What the heck is that? that the opener, you know, we we have Ryan Stanek, who we got from Tampa Bay in a trade, who was one of their openers and, and a really good one. But he's a bullpen guy, and he's a guy that you know we're trying to put him at the back end of our bullpen when we have a chance to to win games yeah. when it really counts. So. I tell you what I really like about the Marlins. You got Derek Jeter, right? I think we all know that name and what he did for the game of baseball. Don Mattingly is our manager. Funny baseball. Baseball guy. Yep. Mike Hill is our general manager, you know, ex-baseball guy. Mm -hmm. you know, Gary Dimbo was with the New York Yan Yankees forever. He's running our system. Baseball guy. We got baseball people. But we do have – we're smart enough to know that analytics play – still play an important part. And younger players that are coming up today have less feel and use their eyes, you know, less than they, it just, you almost have to script things at, at time for these guys. So they can relate to numbers. They understand spin rates. You know, they know what the tilt on a hand is and a release height and release side and extension and all those numbers, break Z, break X. When I'm going, hey, we got our butt kicked. Yeah. yeah. Man, I had I had the best spin rate I've had all year, but we got our butt kicked. We we lost the game, so yeah. you have to balance that. And uh, there's so much that goes into coaching. Oh boy, so much. Yeah, and and I just think about like your dad's era. I mean, I'm sure he never had a he was never on a pitch count in his career. Can't imagine. Never. And uh, probably threw 200 you know odd pitches in games all the time and all that and. It's uh, it's a, I mean, it's still I love the game, but it's it's gotten a little funky sometimes, but yeah, it's different. You know, my dad back in the day would pitch between two hundred and fifty to three hundred innings every year. That's gone. It's out wow. the window. Wow. And you know, one hundred and fifty to one hundred and eighty pitches. It's gone. Yeah, those days are you know they're behind us. Well, and, how many years? Fourteen or something? Or was that your brother? One one of them pitched. Todd played 13. My dad played 11. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, that's a lot of, a lot of miles and, and somehow they made it, right? They made it and they were, they were both really good at it and something to be said, you know, it's in working with these young players, I tend to, to balance all of that stuff out and try to give them a little bit of both. I find myself spending more time, you know, trying to get the players to open their eyes and, and recognize what they see and then have a gut, you know, an instinct and, and to be able to, to pitch to that situation. So, sure. you know, uh, it's the same in, in guiding too, man. Oh boy. You got to keep your eyes open man. keep your eyes open and you got to go with your gut sometimes. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, <laughs> you know, when you're going, okay, Let's see. We got them down river yesterday, but I think they're going to be up river today. You know, that, that first morning, that left or right upstream or downstream turn you make, you know, changes your whole, you know, hero or zero thing. And man, you, yeah, it's a gut thing for sure. So, uh, uh, Paul Ablett, uh, <laughs> the slee stack. Uh, I know, I know you're in the generation that knows what a slee stack is, but there's probably a lot of kids out there that don't know what that is, but, uh, I don't know why. Uh, I don't know if those guys are from Yakima or something. I I don't know. We're Olympic skiers. Yeah, Mara. sure. Yeah, the Mara brothers. But I I don't know what uh, what so they're connected. From Yakima Valley. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So. I don't. You know, I don't know where they're at. They're they're. Uh, yeah, they're probably more famous than than my dad and my brother. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, very 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 prominent name in the. Uh, in the lower valley, in the Yakima Valley. Okay, got it. There's a connection. And then this might be uh Oh, there's my deck hand. Oh, okay. Ready to go. Burger. I'm ready to catch some eyes. You know, you you devil you went as soon as lo and behold, I leave to go to spring training. Guess what I have to get photos of? Oh, that's my wrong. Deck hand, right. This is Greg. 
been my deckhand for a long time, one of my really, really good friends, and a guy that has provided some sanity on days I'm ready to pull my hair out, uh, great partner of mine. But anyway, this guy, this guy heckles my bug eyes when I'm gone. So uh, that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of rude, don't you think? Very much so. <laughs> I don't blame them. They, you know, we all love to eat them, and yes, you know, the, it's I, I don't know. He's he's an ex athlete. He's competitive. I, I think he enjoys enjoys the chase. Yeah, you know, trying to figure the the fish out. But uh, sure. nice to see you, Greg. Um. On, on eating, uh, I had never eaten walleye until I went to Wisconsin. And I've had a lot of clients who've been from the Midwest who, oh, you know, walleye, they speak with it, you know, speak about it with these sort of, you know, just lofty tones. It's so exciting. I mean, walleye is the, the bomb. And so I went, I thought, yeah, I, I think you guys just don't know what you're talking about because you live in the Midwest and there's no – albacore and you know yellow fin and yellow tail and halibut and salmon all that stuff and then i went to wisconsin i was like oh oh it's yeah it's, it's pretty good <laughs> and the the one fish that i liked a little bit better though i gotta say was the yellow perch or the lake perch they call them up there a uh, little bit sweeter maybe mm -hmm. um pretty similar but uh, i think if i had to choose i haven't caught it I actually i have caught yellow perch in in england but uh um, I think I would go with the, give the slight edge to the yellow perch. And that's a, that's a small sample size, but, uh, um, they were both really good though. The walleye was, I mean, pretty tough to beat. Yeah. Perch is something we were raised on as kids in the Northwest. I used to catch them with my grandfather, you know, by the gunny sack full. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Such a nice eating fish and just, you know, a lot like the walleye, uh, you know, there's some fish down here in, in Florida that uh, I started ordering at restaurants that are, are comparable, but much, much bigger and a bigger scale. Uh, you heard a triple tail, yeah. hog fish, and of course, you know, yellow, yellow tail is a nice eating fish, super white, sweet. And so I've been spoiled on some fish down here, but Pacific Northwest, my favorite eating fish is, is walleye. Oh, yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, Mel, I've kept you up late. It's almost midnight back where you are, and uh, I yeah, sure appreciate you coming in, though. It's been fun, and uh, I enjoyed it, man. I appreciate you having me on, and you know, I'm really looking forward to fishing with you someday when when I can slow my life down and yep. we can get you back out there and get rid of this nasty pandemic. Oh, man, I'm so ready for that. Yeah, uh, our guides are, I'm, I'm, and I know you are too. It's really. It's tragic. Those guys not only need to work, but they need to fish, man. It's in their blood. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, you know, one of the reasons, because I was kind of just sitting around, kind of getting into a funk, especially when this whole thing started, just kind of, you know, what do you do? You, you're so used to going, going, going. And then all of a sudden I'm sleeping in because what else is there to do and all that? And I wasn't real productive. I, I still haven't been as productive as I'd like. I think when this is all over, I'm going to go, uh, why didn't I, you know, paint the garage and, you know, just whatever. And, uh, but my wife was like, you know, you need to get up and go fishing. I mean, the lake, you know, it's five minutes from me and, and you need to just go fishing. And I just go for a couple hours, you know, and it's just partially it's for uh sanity sake. And, and uh, I call my little, little John boat that I use my one man uh, solo sanity pod. And, and also it's to try to keep some semblance of a routine because, Holy mackerel, man. It's I just, you know, without structure, I'm just kind of, wow. You know, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, you know, fishing guys, they get used to, to the routine of going out and fishing. And when they come home at the end of the day, they're in a routine. They got to get ready for the next day. And, you know, you go to bed early and all that. So, you know, when you take that part away, it's just like me. I'm, I'm used to getting up super early and going out on a baseball field during spring training. And, and my day is is so routine. And now my sleep habits are horrible. I'm up late at night. Yeah. I'm on the computer all day working on with my website guy and fishing blogs. Uh, and so I'm out of it. And so, it, yeah, you end up being a, a much worse version of yourself. No doubt. And I, my guides, you know, I, I feel for them because 
when you get the fishing part taken away, something that they just love to do. Yeah. Anyhow, even not guiding, they love to fish. It, yep. it, and you don't have that. You get ornery, right? Somebody's going to wear it. We know who that somebody is. <laughs> That's, I think, why my wife said you better get out every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just for her sanity more than anything, but that's, that's fine. Uh, so, um, anyway, so cool. Well, uh, again, thanks, man. It's been so cool chatting and, uh, we'll do it again sometime. And, uh, in the meantime, watch some Korean baseball, I guess. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to be watching your show now that I know that, uh, you got a bunch of extra time on your hands and yes, yes. I'll, uh, I'll send you a reminder every week just in case I'll be looking forward to it. Oh, great awesome. job. well, uh, everybody again, right there, fishdots.com. If you want to go fish for some of those, uh, 20 foot long <laughs> sturgeon, it seems like big steelhead Kings, walleye, smallies, and, uh, some other stuff in the future. So, Anyway, it is, uh, it is, gosh, it's getting late and I appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we will talk to you down the road and hopefully you get, uh, get playing baseball soon. Thanks, JD. Yeah. Sure. Appreciate it. You bet. Thanks, Mel. And, uh, buddy, thanks for tuning in. Uh, hit the, uh, little subscribe button right there. And, uh, next week, Wednesday, 7 PM Eastern, we will be chatting with, uh, who are we chatting with? Uh, I think we're talking to John Sherman, the Sims rep, who was supposed to be this week, but we kind of got our wires crossed. Um, talking about fly fishing for carp, I think, is where we're going with that. So, hey, things always uh, are subject to change, and uh, we'll see, but that's the plan at this point. So, again, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Stay safe, catch some fish, and uh, we will talk to you later. <laughs>